Hello and welcome to Wood's RPG Review, where I give my thoughts on role-playing games, card games and board games. Today's review is Black Sights for Delta Green the role-playing game by Dream Publishing. In this video I'll be covering the fourth scenario in the book, Lover in the Ice. Ok, first a bit of history. Released in 2020, Lover in the Ice is also available as a 32 page print on demand and PDF. It was originally ran on role-playing public radio by author Caleb Stokes as a Call of Cthulhu Delta Green scenario, then was subsequently published without any Delta Green specifics in 2013. In 2016 it was updated and released as a PDF for Delta Green the role-playing game, and finally in 2020 revised and given a final release later being included in this book. There will be spoilers from this point forward so stop watching now if you intend to play this. Additionally, this is perhaps the most disturbing Delta Green scenario to date and contains sexual content and body horror of an adult nature, so please be mindful before continuing. You have been warned. The scenario is set in the January of the year you choose, with a freak ice storm hitting Lafontaine, Missouri on the second day of the month. A cold front has dropped the local temperature by 17 degrees and the subsequent rain that followed has coated everything in around 4 inches of ice. The extreme weather has caused trees to explode, cars to be crushed by fallen tree branches, the electricity to go out and a disaster being called by the governor. A green box that has sat mothballed for many years has alerted Delta Green that something is wrong and the local friendly caretaker is not responding. The contents of the box were never inventoried and eyes are needed on the ground to figure out what has tripped the alarm. The players are the nearest operatives and receive a call on January the 5th from a handler in the usual cover fashion. They're given a time and a place to meet, the TSA conference room at Lambert Airport, St. Louis, Missouri, at 11.45pm that evening. Players are left to make their own way there by whatever means they can. Once there, the TSA agents allow them into the conference room to be greeted by DHS Special Agent Patrick Hill, who they have met previously. He never calls Delta Green by name, referring to them as The Group and gives them a rundown of the situation, that being of the storage unit that has been in use since the early 1990s at Earl's Renter Space, Unit 1701. Its designation is GB224. It's looked after by a friendly who works for Lafontaine City Utilities, who is not an agent but who can be counted on for help as they believe it is a CIA storage facility. It had a silent alarm that warns of intrusions and this was tripped on January the 2nd. Phone lines and cellular towers are down across the city and the door has been open to GB224 for around a week and it is not known what is inside. They've arranged cover for the agents to pose as a FEMA oversight group who will go in with the National Guard and the cover is thin so it shouldn't be pushed and the space has been arranged for them at the city utilities company. The friendly is Skip Mills. Their mission is to speak to him and find out what he knows then go to GB224 and inventory the contents recovering anything they think may have been stolen. They're given a burner phone and can contact Hill by text message on it, being warned to not do anything to draw attention. The next section is called The Dead Author Secrets. The whole incident can be traced back to an author called Ryan Whitehead, a man who was famous during the 60s for being an author similar in style to Hunter S. Thompson. Riding the crest of the wave of fame, he was hired by a San Francisco-based magazine called Blamo to write gonzo journalism, being paid to go to Brazil and report on the Trans-Amazonian Highway. In 1967, he journeyed there with an editor from Blamo called Gabriel Larentinos and childhood friend Albert Kapchka. They were reported as checking in with their military escort and then simply vanished. Whitehead was spotted five months later in his hometown, looking gaunt and having developed a tremor, greeting all questions as to the whereabouts of his party by insisting all would be explained in his next book. He remained under investigation by the police, though was never charged with anything. His drug and alcohol abuse became more pronounced, often raving about monsters lurking in the jungle and his wife divorced him in 1970 with claims of domestic abuse, screaming fits and a lack of intimacy. Blamo sued him and won, claiming damages from his undelivered article and unwillingness to account for the rest of his party. Whitehead assured all that it would be clear in his next novel. The court case and various addictions wiped him out financially and in the late 70s he declared bankruptcy and started drawing government disability, spending the rest of his life locked away in a tiny government assistance apartment, growing more and more reclusive. He tried to sell some of his things in 1981 to a collector and this ended in a double homicide at his apartment complex. He was found dead with a self-inflicted gunshot wound with a note pinned to his chest, apologising for his life and urging whoever found it to not open the box. The note is contained in GB224. 
A Brazilian ammunition box was found near his body by Delta Green agents, who were far underground at the time, and the warning was heeded and it was secured along with his belongings in the green box. The records on Whitehead are available to Delta Green, though the knowledge that the evidence was in GB224 has been lost. Whatever was in the box seems to have been released as a result of the ice storm. The next section is called The Threat. As it turns out, Skip Mills has fallen foul to the contents of the Brazilian ammo box. He's been turned into a reproductive organ of a creature called the Amante, a nightmarish thing from the Amazon that is responsible for Whitehead's life being wrecked. Mills has been driven insane by it and spawned a new Amante that is now picking its way through the city, corrupting and devouring as it goes. If the weather breaks, there's no telling how much damage this could do. The creature has two aspects, the cedar and the incubus. The hellish cedar is a foot-long phallus that the amante leaves implanted in its victims that ends in four serrated bone needles that form a ring around a black gill that acts as an esophagus and provides air and food to the host. Two of the bones are attached to veins that pull blood from the victim, where the phallus changes it biologically to an orange fluid that replaces the blood of the victims. The bones also join with the limbic system. On their own they are of little use, but they can surprise victims by pouncing as a surprise attack. Once embedded in the throat of the victim, they dominate their hormonal production, causing deep depression, but at the same time corrupting the brain's stress and endorphin hormones, changing them to those associated with sexual arousal on turbocharge. This renders them unable to experience joy and any sensation beyond the reproductive instinct that only triggers at times of violence and pain. Those who are dominated sexualize almost all encounters with humans and nothing is taboo to them as they lose their mind attempting to keep control. Risky behaviour controls their stress responses and becomes an anatomical driver for the victim. Sexual fantasies are intense and distracting and they suffer from depraved waking dreams. They become emotionally catatonic and sexual fantasies will quickly change to horrific violent scenarios with disgust giving in to a maddening lust. If a victim sees a violent act while in this state, it is sand draining as their mind slowly crumbles with the desire to join in. After infection, they have two major behaviours, surrender or withdrawal. The pink box here details the game rules for the Cedar and the Incubus. The Incubus is a human corpse that has been converted into an Amante womb. Human DNA and genetic material is broken down and repurposed by the Cedar organ and injected into a corpse. The orange fluid stews inside the unfortunate soul, reassembling itself into a creature, an Amante infant, that feeds on the body of the host until it gets free. As you might imagine, witnessing one of these creatures being birthed is sand draining. So, we move back to the options available to the infected, surrender or withdrawal. Those who surrender are driven to hopeless insanity as they begin to rationalise their murderous sexual rages, with some even concluding that they are being liberated and choosing to save the Amante. They start to put together encounters with large groups of people in order to find suitable hosts for implanting or to murder them with a cedar phallus to provide an incubus. Those who withdraw choose to remove themselves from society, most often those are implanted with the cedar of a dead Amante. As the Amante exerts no influence, they feel more intense shame for their actions, often turning to self-harm, finding any act of violence arousing and sand draining. Those who lose control through sand loss cause the cedar organ to burst forth from the mouth of the host to attack until murder is committed or they are incapacitated. A nightmarish creature indeed. It gives some guidance for agents being infected, as such a thing could compromise the entire mission. It states that they should be given a chance to resist the Amante long enough to flee the scene. If they can stop themselves from screaming in terror by passing a sand check, they can prevent the cedar from being forced down their throats. If they are infected, they instantly pass out, waking up a few minutes later nauseous and exhausted. The player can remain in control of the agent, however each time a fantasy is resisted or violence witnessed, a sand check is made. If they reach breaking point, the handler can give them one chance to commit suicide or lose control completely and attack the nearest warm body. They need to fail a sand test to do this unless they are adapted to helplessness. If they pass the sand roll and attack, they need to make another roll once they realise what they've done, then the whole process begins again. The cedar can be removed by surgery, though this is hard, as it is fighting back, or they could die or reach zero sand, by which point they become a willing servant of the Amante. Okay, so with the background established, let's move on to the timeline of the disaster. It states that between 2001 and 2003, Delta Green was officially reorganised with their resources catalogued and repurposed, as some of the stranger artefacts being housed in green boxes that being unassuming civilian locations. They are rigged with security systems and local friendlies are put in charge of their safety. Such was the case with GB224, with Skip Mills believing he was guarding a CIA storage site. 
On the 2nd of January, you have the storm that strikes La Fontaine that causes the tree branch to snap off and smash through the roof of the storage unit, breaking open the Brazilian ammo container and freeing the cedar organ, it having survived in a state of hibernation. We then move on to the timeline. At 1am, Mills arrives to investigate GB224. This is recorded on security cameras. At 1.05am, the cedar attacks, forcing itself into his throat. Mills passes out. At 1.30am, Mills wakes up and staggers out of the facility. This is also captured on camera. At 2.30am, he arrives home and, driven by the edges of the cedar, murders his mother, turning her corpse into an incubus, slipping into shock at the realisation of what he has done. At 5.45am, fearing discovery and in an attempt to cover his tracks, he goes to work as normal. Between 6.30am and 1pm, he has quite a wild day, with power being out all over the city, and he stays in his office handling calls badly. Interacting with his secretary fills him with the horrific urges that drove him to kill his mother, and he stays in the office looking at pornography in order to quell these temptations, going home eventually as he feels sick. He visits a sex shop and buys a huge amount of pornography, then stays at home committing abuse on himself to resist the otherworldly urges he is experiencing. At 6am January the 4th, the Amante emerges from the corpse of his mother, scrabbling through the ceiling to find victims. At 7.15am, Mills fails to return to work and follows his murderous urges by attacking the agent when they visit him. More on that in a bit. Meanwhile, between 9am to noon, the Amante preys upon pets in the local area, devouring them and growing. At 1.30pm, it implants Melody Farthing while she naps. At 5pm, it overpowers Tilda Hastings as she checks her noises from the room of her roommate. At 9pm, Jonah Washington, the third roommate at 1824 West Ambrosia Street, arrives home and is immediately sexually propositioned by his two roommates. Thinking they are joking as he is gay, he goes along with it, allowing himself to be partially stripped before resisting causing them to attack him. Jonah flees, partially dressed into the cold, with the girls pursuing him until the cedar's aversion to cold causes them to retreat back. At 10.15pm, the girls find the homeless man and offer him refuge in their home. When there, they murder him, filming it, and they spend the rest of the evening watching the tape and abusing themselves to please the amante. On January 5th, the danger spreads. Jonah bleeding, delirious with fear and cold, dies at an ATM where he's sheltered at 1.30am. At 5.30am, the girls call Pamela Decature, their landlady, about a burst pipe in the basement. They also call Chad Bergman, a fellow student, in order to organise a party for that evening. At 9am, Pamela arrives to investigate the pipe and is murdered by the girls to incubate another amante. At 10am, Jonah Washington's body is found by Deputy Eli Filigree. The death is ruled to be a homeless one, though Filigree is unconvinced due to Washington's wounds. At 8pm, Hastings and Farthing journey to Pamela Decature's house with the amante following in the trees. At 8.30pm, Kelly, Pamela's husband, greets the two women at the door and is attacked and killed by the amante along with his son. The Amante feasts on the corpses with Hastings and Farthing watching in bliss. Before they leave, the Amante gifts another cedar to the girls. At 9pm, the Amante begins nesting in the Decature home. By 11pm, Chad Bergman has left a voicemail for the girls saying that power has been restored to the McFillion Hall dormitory and that the party is on for the following evening. At this point, Farthing and Hastings have passed out with exhaustion. On January the 6th, the operation begins with the agents arriving at 7am and Farthing and Hastings trying to get another accomplice by using the cedar. The first thing it goes through is the persons of interest. Here it lists each of the characters that have been part of the Amante's incursion so far, including whether they are dead, a cedar or an incubus, and then we move on to the agents arriving. They roll up in the back of a Navistar Defence 700 MV troop transport that is carrying emergency supplies, and as far as the National Guard are concerned, the agents are part of FEMA, there to monitor the relief effort. It suggests starting the scenario as the truck pulls into town. The first impressions are that almost every road is blocked with fallen trees and that the phone and power lines dangle everywhere. The commercial and university districts have power and the north of the city, a place of warehouses, rail yards and factories, is cut off from the rest. Most homes are damaged and without power, with shelters full of people looking for food and warmth. Luckily, some of the phone lines and cell towers are still working. Any agent who tries to make a call makes a look roll to see if they connect, though they must still treat all non-secure telephone conversations as if somebody that isn't in Delta Green is listening. There's also the National Guard radio frequency, though this is just as risky. The agents are dropped off outside the LaFontaine City Utilities, which is a hive of activity of complaining customers and exhausted linemen. The first person they encounter is Tanya Cambry, who, though made aware of FEMA's involvement, has been unable to find any room for them to set up, directing them to skip Mills' office, as he's been off ill for the last three days. 
Cambria, with the right roles, can be determined to be uncomfortable talking about Mills, having concern for his job and health, and missing work during a disaster will always be held against him. She will say that he looked ill the last time she saw him, with his face covered in sweat and scratches, giving odd stares when she dropped off his mail and lunch. Should the agents search the office, they will find a prefab trailer that can be used for planning and secure comms, as it is isolated, private and warm. It's equipped with tables, a desk and a computer, and they won't be disturbed by city utilities unless forced to, though a continually empty office will become suspicious to the National Guard as they come by seeking coordination. The first thing to do is to look into the actual office itself. Mills' address can be found easily in his correspondence, and his computer is on and logged in. The power grid monitor needs to be logged into, though web browsing and email is functional. A dive into the search history finds vile and pornography on his last day that can drain San. His email password can be found written on an index card at the bottom of his desk. A look into his email determines that he sent out a memo of addresses where power was down, and then a second memo minutes later that there is a specific address to be ignored. Earl's renter space, the location of GB224. A search of the room will find the password to the power grid monitor and control program, and quite disturbingly, semen stains on the underside of the desk. Dialing star 69 on the phone will reveal that the last place he called was a sex shop, Calling the number will have the owner tell him to not risk coming out there as he was cleaned out by a collector a few days ago, the day Mills went home sick. The motor pool of the city utilities is currently at HQ for the relief effort, with command tents and generators taking up the space. Deputy Filigree is around trying to get help from the linemen to get access to the power grid monitor programme in order to investigate the death of a homeless man that he finds suspicious. He wants to find out where the nearest residence that had heat in the area was so that he can investigate it, figuring that he could get a promotion if he gets to the bottom of it. His reasons for thinking it is suspicious are more clearly outlined should they get to examine the body that is currently in the city morgue, and filigree is someone that the agents can get on their side with the right roles. It makes note that at night time they can hear strange hoots and clicks echoing over the city, and then we move on to Earl's renter space and GB224. It is open 24-7 to those who know the unlock code, and a quick examination of the outside sees a gigantic tree limb has crushed a number of units facing the highway. The agents can easily gain access through part of the chain link fence that has collapsed. Inside the property, the agents can see security cameras that are down due to the power outage. A portable battery and some good skill rolls can power up the surveillance monitor, and will show the recordings detailed earlier. Once inside GP224, they can see it as a jumbled mess of boxes, plastic evidence bags and ice-coated wood. The security motion sensor is down, but can be found plugged in. In a corner near where the branch is broken through is a footprint alongside a pool of frozen, bloody vomit. Should the handler want to give the agent a bit of the flavour of the strange and disturbing Delta Green has to offer, it lists a number of oddities that have been stored here. Among these are a list of descriptions of hands printed on yellow dot matrix paper around 40 inches thick. It gives an exact description of the hands, and if the agents take the time to read it, they eventually find their own hands described with two fairly disturbing final entries. There's a violin that is silent when played but can be heard in other rooms, even through walls and a load of other oddities that should give your players the creeps that I won't spoil here. The thing they are looking for can also be found. The notes on the Amazon trip by Whitehead, which are handouts at the back of the book, alongside a suicide note and the empty ammunition crate. The players should read the notes, and can surmise that an unnatural thing was cut from the mouth of Albert Kapchka that was in the crate and is now gone. It was from a tropical climate, sex and violence are involved in what this thing does, and it communicates by hooting, and Whitehead led a life of reclusiveness due to the Amazon events. The next section detailed is the city morgue, where the corpse of Jonah Washington is kept. Deputy Filigree can get them access if he trusts them, or alternatively they can flash their FEMA credentials. They can also break in as the security is down due to the storm. Jonah's corpse is stored here, and his state of undress is immediately suspicious, almost like he ran away while getting undressed. Working on Filigree's notion of the nearest heated location, they can use the grid programme if they've managed to get into it, to pick out 1824 West Ambrosia Street. They can also identify him by the National Guard tattoo on his chest. Those trained in forensics can find the four-pronged puncture wounds of the cedar, and further examination can reveal orange fluid leaking out. An extended examination can determine that each wound had a different purpose, that two of the punctures were drawing out blood, and the other two were injecting orange fluid. Analysis of the orange fluid using the right equipment and skills can determine it to be made up of partial DNA strands and potentially capable of growing something organic in a few days and that it is compatible with human biology. The next stop is the home of Skip Mills. He lived with his mother a few miles from the city utilities. No one answers if the door is knocked on and the windows have been papered over and jazz music is playing loudly inside. There's a strange stench about the place and the doors are unlocked. 
Should the agent enter the home, they will find the walls plastered with pornography of every type, as well as all screens broadcasting it and the heat being sweltering and smelling of organic decay. Mill can be found wandering around the house naked, emaciated and in a psychosexual fugue. You will get angry at the agents and the cedar will attack. Should Mills be dealt with, the house can be found to contain pornography of every deviance imaginable, put there by Mills in an effort to stop himself leaving to find new victims. A medical examination will determine that he should have passed out days ago due to dehydration and exhaustion. Should they find Skip's mother, she's barely recognisable as a hollowed out husk that is spread out over the room. It's obvious to those with forensics that something has emerged from her bloated corpse and bloody primate-like handprints can be found on the wall alongside claw marks that have torn through the ceiling and into the attic, which is empty as the exterior fan has been smashed out. The nearest heat source is 1824 West Ambrosia Street, which is next up. An old house turned into a rental for students. It has space enough at the back for cars to park and is owned by Pamela Decature and rented by Jonah Washington, Tilda Hastings and Melody Farthing. There are currently three cars parked there. Two covered in ice and a jeep that is clean. Nobody will answer the door if the agents knock. It is currently occupied by two incubi, the homeless man that the girls murdered and Pamela Decature. If they check out the basement, they can find the cellar door has been clawed through and scraps of grey flesh hanging from the splinters. The pipes have clearly not burst and they will find the bloated body of Pamela Decature in the corner with orange fluid dripping from her nose and eyes. A phone which can be found amongst the gore will have voicemails from Hastings and Farthing. Moving on to the first floor, they can find signs of a struggle in one of the bedrooms, alongside bits of Jonah Washington's clothes and some pet bowls in the kitchen, but no pets. They can find a portrait of Jonah Washington and his boyfriend, along with a document showing he was coming home from a reservist weekend when the storm hit, alongside the jeep keys. There is also a blanket tacked to a wall that hides bloody smears on the wallpaper, and in Tilda's room is a phone that has a message from Chad Bergman saying the party is on. There's also a laptop which has a browser history littered with violent pornography, as well as a webcam video of the girls murdering the homeless man that is incredibly graphic. Also in one corner of the room is a disturbing sculpture of the Amante. Farthing's room has a bed covered in bloody sheets and the corpse of the homeless man the girls murdered. When the agents investigate it, an immature Amante will tear itself from his corpse and will flee if it deposits its cedar or starts to lose the fight. It will head to the Truman Memorial High School. Melody has also been painting pictures of the cedar that are fairly accurate. It then shifts to Pamela Decature's home. She lives in a cheap two-bedroom house and her son and husband lay rotting in the living room in hothouse conditions. The Amante born from Skip Mills' mother lurks in the attic here and it will attack anybody that enters its area, either trying to kill or infect them, though it will flee to the high school if outnumbered. A message can be found on Kelly's phone from the girls in West Ambrosia Street saying that his wife left tools there and they would like to return them. Truman Memorial High School is somewhere that is sheltering refugees and a place where the Amante seeks hosts and prey. The lights are dim, with only torches and lanterns being used, allowing the Amante to strike from the darkness, picking off those that wander about alone. If the agents go in guns blazing here, it will cause a mass panic and the authorities being called, should they be able to get through. Those thinking outside the box may jury-rig the lights of the scoreboard, which will light up the Amante swinging in the rafters or the public address system to hide the hoots of communication. Also, school sports equipment can be repurposed, things like baseball bats. And there's also a chainsaw outside the entrance next to a pile of tree limbs. The McFillion Hall is the location of the party that the agents should be aware of. The party is Caligula-esque and Hastings and Farthing need to be stopped before they use their seed organs to infect Chad Bergman. If the agents delay for any reason, this will happen. Then the three of them will enact a plan to start isolating students with the promise of sex in order to make them incubi for a horde of Amante to be ready when the students return to class. As with the high school, shots being fired causes a mass panic with the same results, so discretion is advised. Finally, we come to the conclusion. It's estimated by the time the agents find the original Amante and the sea that it will be too late to deal with both. If the high school is ignored, then the results could be catastrophic. Similarly, the dawn party could lead to a dozen amante. The icy conditions are favourable to the agents, and preventing an outbreak means dealing with both issues, preferably at the same time, which could mean splitting up the party. The icy conditions, of course, won't last forever, and there could be legal repercussions and information leaks, with survivors that witness the amante or see the attacks being a problem that the agents may need to deal with by helping them correctly understand what they actually saw. Of course, dosing witnesses with hallucinogens could help this, however immoral and dangerous that may be. Should the agents fail their mission, rioting will start at the university, spreading throughout La Fontaine, with the deaths from the ice storm being drastically underestimated. 
Rumours were spread of the government wiping out entire buildings with thermite, but obviously that's just crazy talk. Finally, we have the stats for the Amante itself, including all of its powers and a good description, as well as stats for Deputy Eli Filigree and Skip Mills, and handouts for the suicide note and the account of the Amazon journey written by Whitehead. And lastly, a Delta Green character sheet. Lover in the Ice is about as unsettling a scenario as has been released by Arc Dream Publishing to date, and the irony of the title was not lost on me. Parts of it were so gruesome they were actually hard to get through, and I even know somebody who walked out of this in a convention because it was just too much for them. The Amante are about as awful a villain as one can imagine. There really isn't that much actual malice in what they do. It's a matter of survival, using an almost alien method that's just too disturbing for us to acknowledge, and the way the Cedar transforms the thought process of those infected to become psychosexual murderers who are unable to feel joy in any real sense unless they are doing the will of the Amante, and the way it so easily strips away the humanity is ghoulish to contemplate. Murder committed by those infected is only calculated in the sense that they serve a master and it's really not personal, just animalistic. The background storyline is excellently realised, so much so that it takes up a fair chunk of the book, and the contents of BG-224 have a number of adventure seeds and strange evidence items that hint of a bigger picture that I found on point for what Delta Green is trying to achieve, and at times they were even more disturbing than what the Amante was doing. The handouts tell an excellent story, in a Hunter S. Thompson-esque manner, that players are sure to appreciate, and the art throughout is decent, though the Amante doesn't really look as terrifying as described, and it's worth mentioning that the isolation due to the storm, and the sense of general abandonment around the city paints a stark background to the events of the scenario, and serves well to add to the atmosphere. And when you add the hoots and whistles of the Amante communicating to each other on the desolate ice-covered streets, it definitely delivers on the creepiness scale. The big issue really for me is how careful a handler should be when running this. I would suggest really knowing the people you run this for before doing so, as the way the scenario is set up to use the content contained within could be really offensive and troubling for some people. Convention play should probably be avoided if it's for a group of strangers. Additionally, the sandbox type of structure of the scenario may leave some players wondering what on earth they need to do next, as I feel one or two of the clues are a little less obvious than they should be. The password to the power grid monitor being on the back of the calendar, for example. However, Should you be able to in some way get past some of the more obvious hurdles that this scenario presents, this is an absolute top draw scenario, and just as disturbing as it should be for a game of Delta Green's pedigree. With a group and a handler who are jointly fully invested in the creepiness and body horror that Lover in the Ice serves up, this could genuinely be an amazing experience for all involved, and one that they can be sure to not forget in a hurry. I think this is one of the best Delta Green scenarios released to date. However, the degree of forethought that needs to be given by potential handlers could mean that some people don't get to play this. Or perhaps handlers could feel even a bit scared to run it in the current climate, given the sexual predator qualities of the Amante and its subject. But make no mistake, this is peak Delta Green and something I think seasoned players will really enjoy. I give it a 9 out of 10. Okay, that concludes part 4 of Black Sites. Part 5 will be Sweetness.